Gregory Darwin, who was recently appointed senior lecturer in Irish at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. Um, he has recently been uh, producing a uh, an article on the use of Greek and Roman classical traditions in Irish poetry um, and is working on a monograph concerning uh, marriages between humans and selkies, i.e. Um, mermaids who take seal form rather than fish form um, in Irish, Scottish and Scandinavian folklore. And he also would like me to let you know that he was producing sourdough, you know, in baking before it became cool during the lockdown. So moving from Iran to Ireland, I would like to hand you over to Greg. Thank you very much. And I'm going to try and share my screen right now. Hopefully that should work. Um, can you all hear me, by the way? Great. Uh, where is the screen sharing thing? Sorry, I'm not on my normal computer, so I'm a little bit hopeless right now. Great. Can you see this? Perfect. Right. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank um, both the organizers, Drs. Uh, Davis and Swist, for putting together what has been a fantastic forum for to hear and take part in all sorts of interesting um, discussions that have been crossing lines of uh, area, methodology, discipline, and things. It's been really a fantastic experience, and this has been my first metal studies conference as well. So it's been, yeah, it's 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 been incredible, as well as. Um, as my fellow panelists, um, Paki's paper in particular is a very hard act to follow, I feel. Um, and also anyone who is familiar with Irish archaeology is probably screaming at this image right now, but so it goes. Uh, before I properly begin, I'd like to point out a few details about myself that might lead to potential biases in dealing with this material. Um, like most of us here, obviously, I'm a metal fan and a fan of many of the specific bands that I'll be discussing. Um, as you can no doubt tell from my accent, I did not grow up in Ireland. And while I have spent a considerable amount of time there and spoken to many people from there, I don't have the exact same perspective and education as someone who has been, um, as we say, born and reared on the island. And so my perspective is that of an outsider. And the Irish language and Gaelic culture, especially in the six counties that remain part of the United Kingdom, are at times politi politically fraught issues. And while be attempting to be as um, objective as possible in discussing the history and politics of the island, as an Irish speaker, it's impossible to remain truly neutral on some of these issues. And like I mentioned, this is my first time at a metal studies conference, and I'm new to the subfield as well as to reception studies in general. So someone quoted Dina Weinstein's comments about this being a under theorized field. I'm afraid my contribution is definitely going to fit that bill. Uh, so I'll begin. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So I'll begin by giving a brief introduction to uh, the Irish language, literary context, historical context, and so on. Uh, this is just to provide a bit of background for those of us who are not specialists in this area, which I would imagine is most of us here. Um, next, going to discuss my methodology briefly, followed by an overview of the findings I've had, um, the bands which draw upon Irish saga and the, and the lyrics, as well as the ways in which they do so. Uh, then I'll discuss some of the possible sources through which these bands might have had access to these sagas, as well as the ways in which these saga characters and narratives are typically used in the music I've looked at. And then finally, I'll turn to the use of language before uh, concluding. And the history of Ireland, as was pointed out in the comments uh, in the last in, earlier in this panel, is very complicated, to put it mildly. So I'm going to be giving a very, very brief overview. I'm going to be condensing about 2,000 years of history and 800 very significant years of history into less than a minute. So I'm going to, out of necessity, leave out a lot, for which I apologize invariably. Uh, but the Irish language, sometimes referred to as Irish Gaelic or just Gaelic, or by the endonyms Gaelge, Gaelig, Gaelin, and so on, is an Indo-European language which belongs to the Celtic branch. It's therefore closely related to Scottish Gaelic and Manx, more distantly to Welsh, Breton, and Cornish, and still more distantly to the continental Celtic languages such as Celtiberian and Gaulish, which no doubt many of you will be familiar with through the works of Eleviti, Eleviti rather. And exactly when Irish or indeed any Celtic language first began to be spoken on the island of Ireland is a matter of some debate, but there's certainly ample evidence for its use in Ireland in late antiquity. And by the early Middle Ages, it was the main language of that island. And throughout the Middle Ages, with the exception of the Anglo-Norman settlement in the area around Dublin and various uh, Viking settlements in places such as Dublin, Cork, and so on, um, it was the language of the island. Um, and while it's often said that Irish is the oldest language in Europe, this is not true, of course, but it does boast one of the oldest vernacular languages in Europe's, vernacular literatures in Europe, sorry. During the early Middle Ages, Irish literati began writing on both Lat in both Latin and Old Irish on a variety of topics, including most relevant to the topic at hand, um, narratives set in Ireland's distant past, 
populated by godlike supernatural beings and larger than life heroes. These tales are often compared fruitfully with the Old Norse sagas. Uh, both are written down much later than the events which they purport to describe. Both are produced within decidedly Christian literary milieu, but paradoxically are um, our best and earliest sources for pre-Christian mythology in these areas. Um, the writing and rewriting and copying of these sagas took place, uh, continued throughout the later Middle Ages and into the early modern period. Although literary production was slowed down by the destruction of the native aristocratic institutions, which supported these, this production under successive British monarchs, and the fact that the prestige of the English language caused language shift from Irish to English throughout much of the country. Um, there's some dispute in terms of the, the historiography of Ireland in terms of whether we can call this colonialism or not. And while I'm sympathetic to the stance that Ireland is in the global north and benefits from that, uh, that I'm taking the position that if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, and oppresses native language and cultural institutions like a duck, it's colonialism. Uh, these texts become available to English-speaking audiences in Ireland and beyond through translations and adaptations made in the 18th and 19th centuries as part of a Europe-wide turn towards antiquarianism and romantic nationalism is the same intellectual turn that produces texts such as the Kalevala in Finland, which we heard about. Um, and around the turn of the 20th century, artists such as Lady Gregory and William Butler Yeats, whose picture we see here, made use of these stories in an attempt to create a distinct, unique literature for the emerging nation of Ireland. And this movement is often referred to as the Celtic Twilight after the title of a collection of William Butler Yeats' poetry. And during the 20th century, as many of you will know, all but six of the 32 counties gained independence from the United Kingdom. Although Irish was and still is a minority language, it was given a privileged, at least symbolic status in the new state, where it was, and again, still is taught in schools. And these medieval Irish narratives formed part of the national mythology. Um, a few examples on the left, we have Cúchulainn in the Dublin Post Office, uh, which is the site of a fairly decisive battle um, in, uh, that led up to the Revolutionary War. On the right, we have Queen Medhav in uh, Dublin uh, on a street where it walked by every day for about a year. Uh, and while it's not officially recognized in the same way, these same narratives are significant for different communities in the six counties and have been used in various, in, in various and at times completely contradictory ways. The image on the right is genuinely cursed, and if I had to see it, so do all of you. I could have written this paper on a a fairly small number of bands whose main inspiration is early Celtic, early Irish or Celtic tradition, so-called Celtic metal bands such as Cruachan and Waylander. But I was more curious when I wrote the abstract about the overall global impact of these texts and narratives on metal as a genre, the sort of global and wider spread of uh, ideas of the, of the Celtic and the Irish. And given the amount of material that I was able to find, I probably should have gone with the, with the first option. Um, but I began by making a list of the major figures of the main medieval Irish literary cycles, as well as various territorial names, including variant spellings, um, which figure prominently in the literature. And once I had a list of names, we'll be familiar with this, I'm sure. Uh, I made use of the Metal Archives search to find groups. Right, and for each song that the search returned, I would then read through the lyrics to confirm that this was in fact a reference to early Irish tradition and added any names that I might have uh, that might be mentioned that I might have missed to the list and continued and did this several times until I got a, uh, until I arrived at the list that I have now. Um, so examples of some things that kind of came up with this. Um, some of these are obviously not actually mentioned, not actually references to Irish tradition. For example, the name Balor is is the same as a common noun in the Papiamentu language, which was used by the band Morto Casho. And one version of the name Finn represent, resembles a, a common verb in some Scandinavian languages. And references to the province of Ulster also turned up to, also included reference to, references to 20th century conflicts in the region. And this included the very unfortunate uh, discovery of an Ulster NSVM scene, uh, RIC scene rather. Um, limitations, of course. Uh, there are obviously limitations here. For one, I could only search lyrics which had been posted to the site, but this is a problem that I think all of us have, have faced. Um, and songs which retold or alluded to Irish saga without mentioning characters or places by name did not appear in these searches, obviously. So some bands would appear on the basis of this to be less interested in Irish tradition than we might see from a reading of their lyrics or of their interviews and press releases. I could also only search for alternate spellings of which I was aware of or found by chance during my searches. So this meant that most of my search results were in languages that I already knew, which, uh, 
And I might have mislang missed artists writing in languages I didn't know, especially those writing in languages which use non-Latin scripts, such as uh, the various Slavic languages which use Cyrillic. Uh, although, of course, I wouldn't have been able to do much with this if I had found this sort of information, because if I can't read a language, uh, Google Translate is only so good. Uh, I also didn't uh, consider bands that were making use of other Celtic languages or traditions. So for example, we had a, an excellent paper yesterday on the reception of Boudicca. And uh, this, this is beyond the scope of what I'm looking at currently. Likewise, vague invocations of the Celts or the Celtic or Druids uh, was beyond the scope of this. So a band like Celtic Frost, whose name is a deliberate invocation of the, um, the ruin of former grandeur is outside the scope of this. Likewise, Eliveti, who sing in a reconstructed Gaulish, but make use of Irish and Scottish tunes. Um, there's no doubt a lot to be said about the use of different Celtic language traditions in metal. In particular, I'm very interested at the moment of the use of Breton by French bands, especially those from areas like Normandy and Ile-de-France that have no obvious connection with Brittany, as well as the juxtaposition of different Celtic language traditions, especially in terms of music. But this is these are discussions that deserve to be given their own time and space. And especially in terms of music, I have no formal training in musicology. So this is something that um, Jeremy was talking about uh, collaboration. And this is something that, you know, hopefully this, uh, this conference can help facilitate. But in total, um, I found 181 bands which had at least one song, which definitely was an invocation of medieval Irish tradition in some way. And the vast majority of these only had one of these bands only had one song which fit the bill, only had one song which seemed to be a clear reference or invocation of, of medieval Irish tradition. There are 42 that had two to four that turned up, although in some cases this turn, in many cases actually this represented a single song which had appeared on multiple releases, such as demo and album, album and single, album and compilation, or some combination thereof. Uh, most of these bands are European, although only three of this category are actually from Ireland, and um, a small number come from the Americas, Canada, the US, Mexico, Peru, and Argentina. Only 11 bands had uh, a more sustained engagement with, uh, with Irish tradition in particular, and of these, a plurality of these are from Ireland, um, including both the uh, 26 and the six counties. So from Ireland, we have Celtachor, Cruachan, Milmora and Primordial, all from Dublin, and Waylander from the north. Um, and outside of Ireland, we have six. Uh, from the USA are Absu and Slaufeg, and from, two from Germany, go to Mendes and Sweet Acre. Uh, Tuatha de Danann, hail from Brazil. Um, there's a bit of a discussion about them in the comments, and Arakidlov from Greece. And for all 11 of these bands, the Encyclopedia Metallum unsurprisingly identifies the genre or lyrical themes as Celtic in some way. And so we observe right away that while interest in Irish tradition is far more widespread than just in Ireland alone, most of the highly sustained engagement with that tradition is coming from Irish bands. Most subgenres of no, uh, most subgenres of metal are represented in these foundings, although folk and black metal are by far the most widespread. These are genres which are preoccupied with the pagan and pre-Christian past. So in light of this, it's not at all surprising that most of the references I found are to beings who are frequently identified as pre-Christian deities in the literature, especially those who preside over warfare, battle, slaughter, death, and similarly generically appropriate concerns. By far, the most commonly invoked figure is the Morihu or the Morhen, the phantom queen who appears in the form of a raven, presides over battle and war, inspiring warriors to greatness, prophesying death and slaughter, striking terror into the hearts of armies. Um, she appears in over half the songs found, and for many bands, she's the only character from Irish tradition that, who they seem concerned with. So for example, Children of Bodom, or Code of Behavior, as the case may be, uh, has this uh, single from their album, I Worship Chaos, called Morrigan. The song itself is not actually about the Morrigan, it's really about a bad breakup and substance abuse, which as unfortunately many of us know, is how poor Alexi ended up. But uh, as you can see from the single cover, as well as the, uh, as well as the video, they really lean into the, the raven goddess uh, aspect of things. Beyond this, references to the Tuatha Dé Danann, the uh, people of the goddess Danu, are quite common. These are beings who are supposed to have inhabited Ireland before the coming of humans and are often understood as the pre-Christian gods of Ireland. And in many cases, their names are uh, direct cognates with names that are attested as continental Celtic deities. Um, Lug, the warrior and master of all crafts, who saved the Tuatha Dé Danann from the, from the demonic Fóvara, Balor, the king of the Fowara, whose one eye has destructive power. 
Dagva, the good god and all-father whose club has power over life and death. Nuatha, the former king of the gods who earned the epithet, the epithet Argetlov, silver hand, after losing his hand in battle and receiving a silver one. Mananon, the god of the sea and protector of the Isle of Man. And Krom Kruach, who supposedly received human sacrifices in great numbers until St. Patrick put an end to his worship. Bands also draw upon, yeah. Uh, specific narrative cycles from early Irish literature. And we heard a little bit about this from Marios in his work in uh, Folkworth and Folkodia. Um, the first and second battles of Moitra, uh, Moitra where the two of the day defeated the Firwolog and the Fowara respectively are popular choices, as is the Leor Gawala Ed in the Book of Takings or Invasions of Ireland, which tells how the ancestors of the Gael first settled the island. Retellings of uh, the Tombo Kuldna, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, the epic war between the province of Ulster and the rest of Ireland centered around the exploits of the young hero Cúchulainn are also relatively popular. Stories of Fionn Macul and his warrior band are somewhat less frequent but do appear, and here the modern tale of Oshin and Niamh in Sir Nanog, the land of eternal youth, seems to be the most popular choice. Um, Folkodia has a song on this, for example. Uh, finally, some bands seem to draw upon medieval and later history from Ireland, Brian Borwa or Brian Baru, the High King of Ireland who prevailed at the Battle of Clontarf, which popular historiography has presented as the end of Viking domination in Ireland, as well as Grania Wheel or Grace O'Malley, a 16th century pirate queen. Now, in most cases, the references are sufficiently vague and um, such that it's difficult to pin down any one particular source. A line such as, so we only ask of the Morrigan for warrior's death in folk earths before battle I embrace is fairly typical and doesn't really give us much to work on. Many of the specific narratives which I mentioned are part of the wider cultural and national consciousness, both in Ireland and then in the diaspora, and are frequently told and retold in various ways and various media, including through the education system in Ireland. And so again, it's difficult to pin down any specific channels of transmission. In other words, these are stories that everyone in Ireland knows. And since bands rarely diverge significantly from popular understandings of these stories, it seems pointless to narrow down which particular version they had read or which retelling they had heard. In a small number of cases, non-Irish bands are receiving this material through covers of songs by Irish bands, in particular, Gary Moore, Thin Lizzy, and The Horse Lips. And The Horse Lips and Gary Moore were both inspired in particular by Thomas Kinsella's 1969 translation of the Tawn, which they mention in interviews that they've made. Um, in some cases, though, we can identify specific translations and adaptations. Um, uh, for example, the Russian band Sanctorium seems to have, been, to have borrowed their version of the tale of Ton Chlina from Lady Gregory's Gods and Fighting Men. The Dutch band Ordo Draconis' song, Dertra of the Soros, of the Soros sorry, uh, comes from John Millington Singh's play of the same name. And Primordial's song, The Hosting of the She, is a musical setting of the poem by, um, by Yeats. The American band Slaufeg, formerly the Lord Weird Slaufeg, um, takes its name from one of the primary antagonists in Pat Mill's comic series, Slanya, published in 2000 AD. Um, the magazine 2000 AD, not the year. Um, Slanya draws upon medieval Irish literature, especially the Ulster cycle, and combines it with elements of pulp fantasy, theosophy, and Lovecraftian horror. And like most of Mill's work, J Judge Dredd is probably one of his best known works. It's characterized by extreme violence and an anti-authoritarian ethos. In other words, it's metal as fuck. Slaufeg's first three albums draw heavily upon Slanya, and the way that Irish mythology is presented in these albums is entirely consistent with the comics. Likewise, Gota Mendes, um, for example, they refer to Krom Kruach as the time maggot, which is something taken right from the pages of Slanya. Um, again, the Lovecraftian influence is quite palpable there. Um, in addition to citing Slanya as an influ influence, the Greek band Aragidlov claims to have been, uh, Silverhand, uh, claims to have been inspired to write about Irish mythology when guitarist and founder Alexander Vasilopoulos read the fantasy novel, The Silver Arm, which is an adaptation of the Second Battle of Motulov by the Irish author and artist, Jim Fitzpatrick, who is perhaps best known for the, his now iconic 1968 portrait of Che Guevara. Uh, most interviews, however, give very little information about literary sources, and this is not terribly surprising. Um, I'm probably one of the few people who actually seems to really care which translation of the Tawn a, a band might have used. But it seems most likely that uh, most of these bands, especially those outside of Ireland, are getting their information from um, Irish about Irish tradition from such popular adaptations, as well as semi-scholarly works and increasingly online sources such as Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, most uh, bands' interest in Irish tradition is fairly superficial, and it seems that stories and images are chosen 
mostly because they contain elements of larger than life heroism or horror, which lend themselves well to metal. For bands which represent themselves as pagan metal, Irish tradition provides images of a pre-Christian past, which is often juxtaposed with images of other European paganisms. For example, we find Morgan and Odin uh, juxtaposed quite a lot because they both like ravens. Um, as well, these provide images of resistance against dominant cultures, Rome, Britain, the church. Uh, some bands seem to approach early Irish tradition simply as if it were fantasy literature. For example, as I mentioned, Slough Fegg's earlier albums draw upon Irish sagas as mediated through the comic Slania. And their third album, Down Among the Dead Men, combines songs and combines songs based off of Slania with songs based on the world of the tabletop role-playing game Traveler, um, which forms the subject of their fourth album. The, sorry, I'm losing my place here. Arcadius Antonic of the German band Swedakra claims that stated in an interview that our plan is not simply to retell Celtic stories, we add some fantasy to them to make it all much more interesting. Uh, for some bands, and I'm, this is all going to be on the, um, the drive, I'm also going to be posting a um, transcript of my talk since I am aware of the fact that I'm speaking quite quickly, um, but I'm also not gonna have time to let these interview quotes be read really, so. Um, Right, so for some bands, especially those from North America, unawareness of Irish heritage has led them to their, this material. So for example, Prescriptor McGovern of Absu in a 2001 interview says that since there's such a short history behind North America, I think it's most important that we express our ancestral attributions with our Irish, with our Scottish and Irish bloodlines. And this is of course a very much a settler's perspective on North American history um, and its length, but um, Jeremy Perkins of the Montreal-based band Wiccan describes the, band, the band's EP, Bridget of the Night, named after the Irish goddess as an ode to my roots, leaving a part of our roots and history in the books before forgotten. For other European bands, the Celtic heritage of which Irish tradition forms a part is a convenient shared European heritage. And unfortunately, this idea can be used in support of some rather repugnant political traditions. And for obvious reasons, I don't want to platform these bands. Now, uh, bands from within Ireland, am I, yeah, position themselves in relation to this tradition and to contemporary questions of nationalism in a variety of ways. Um, Waylander comes from the north of Ireland with members of both uh, nationalist and loyalist backgrounds. And in many of the interviews, they have articulated an explicit rejection of contemporary politics and, and sectarian clashes in Ireland. Many members are self-identified pagans for whom the question of Catholic or Protestant is entirely meaningless. Still, the question of Gaelic tradition is, the use of Gaelic tradition is inherently political to some degree, and many of their lyrics reveal frustration with this current status quo and a desire for a return to a simpler time in which single combat between brave warriors was the norm, rather than bombings and extrajudicial murders. Keltachur don't mention their politics in any of the interviews that I've read, and instead outward, uh, yeah, instead outright deny any attempts to make parallels between the Ireland, the mythic past, and the present day. For them, their stated aim is to tell and preserve the stories which make up the cultural heritage. The Cork-based band Corvona, or Corvona as they would say, um, have articulated a commitment to biological and cultural diversity, and this can be seen in their choice of name. Corvona is the Irish name for the grey heron, literally the crooked thing of the bog. Uh, and it's a frequent site in the wetlands of the native West Cork, as well as through their commitment to singing in a minority language, Irish. The band members describe themselves as atheists, but have expressed an appreciation for paganisms, which are both pluralistic and rooted in place. And, and some of their lyrics reject explicitly modern articulations of nationalism. Um, over the course of their own career, Primordial have sought to distance themselves from the label of folk metal. And this has included a move away from drawing upon more explicit uh, more explicitly drawing upon medieval Irish tradition in favor of more recent history, Christian symbolism, and early modern English language literature. And true to his namesake, Alan Nevthanga, Poison Tongue, has articulated, has positioned himself as a, crit as a critic of modernity and the status quo. And most recently, this has taken the form of this podcast, which due to the volume of, my, of material and my general dislike of the, of the media, I, of the medium, I can't really give an adequate uh, assessment of. Uh, I will say that our esteemed hosts uh, participation on Dirty Sexy History was a notable exception. Uh, Kruachan is by far the most conventionally nationalist of the bands that I've discussed so far, and they've covered a number of explicitly nationalist songs, such as Oro Shid by um, revolutionary leader Patrick Pierce, and I Wish I Was Back in Home in Derry, a song written by Christy Moore about the um, Republican hunger striker Bobby Sands. Their fourth album, Pagan, 
begins with a song about the revolutionary leader Michael Collins. Um, and the rest of the album focuses on Brian Beru and the Battle of Clontarf, which I mentioned is seen in popular historiography as the defeat of Viking domination in Ireland. Anachronistically, though, Brian and his forces are presented as being pagans preserving their land from Viking intrusions. This is a rejection of, this, of the very Catholic nationalist faith and fatherland narratives that had grown up around the battle in 19th and 20th century historiography. And in an interview from circa 2002 or so, Frontman Keith Fay states that while he does not condone some of the IRA's tactics, he agrees with their motives and principle and refuses to give them a right condemnation. So a common thread among many of these bands and these different political stances is a sense of cultural pride and an interest in that which is particular to Ireland and a desire to commemorate and present that to a wider audience. But along with that, a fairly marked rejection of more militant forms of nationalism. And this can be contrasted with other artists using the Irish language or Irish tradition in other genres. For example, the one that comes to mind immediately is the Be Belfast-based Irish language hip hop group, Kneecap, who, as you can see from their name, uh, which is a fairly playful and flippant invocation of uh, paramilitary violence. They embrace it fully a mil an aesthetic of militant Irish republic republicanism, complete with balaclavas and Adidas tra trainers. Um, I want to offer finally some observations on the use of the Irish language by the band surveyed. Bands from outside Ireland will occasionally attempt to use bits of Irish um, in song titles and lyrics, ranging from the use of proper names to brief passages to attempts to write entire songs in Irish. Invariably, these bands outside of Ireland make mistakes, um, ranging from simple grammatical errors or misspellings. Um, one thing which is quite common is uh, the Sheena Fada, the acute accent used to indicate a long vowel, is often mistaken for an apostrophe. Um, to using Scottish Gaelic instead of Irish, or just producing complete utter gibberish, um, suggesting that no one in the band had access to an Irish speaker that they could check things by. And I should note that um, most of this is happening in the 1990s and the two early 2000s, where um, resources uh, for learning the Irish language online were quite scarce, and the public profile of the language online is nothing like what it is today, which is admittedly saying something. None of the bands from Ireland that I've discussed come from traditionally Irish speaking areas, which are known as Gaeltacht, and these are the areas that are green in the map. Um, most of the bands are from Dublin, Corwuna are from Cork, and Waylander are from the north with members coming from Armagh Town and Lisburn. And Lisburn is a traditionally loyalist area very near, very near Belfast. Um, I've only found one band which sings entirely or even mainly in Irish, and that's the Cork based pagan doom metal band uh, Corwuna, as I mentioned. Other Irish bands make use of the language, although not the same, not to the same extent. Um, songs and album titles in Irish are common, often with mistakes, and Irish language versions of proper names are used in English language songs. Uh, Cruachan covers two Irish language traditional songs, Orosha de Vahawalia and Serawaru. Serawaru made famous by um, the version recorded by the Donegal-based band Clanad. Uh, Waylander's setting of The King of the Fairies, a traditional fiddle tune, includes a spoken word portion in Irish delivered by Kieran O'Hagan. And Primordial's first album, Imrava, which is a genre of tale in medieval Irish. Um, the opening song of this is in Irish, Fuil Arsa, um, Ancient Blood. And Irish language titles and lyrics have appeared um, from time to time in subsequent albums, including the most recent release, Exile Among the Ruins. This engagement with the Irish language is without, with the exception of a few words and proper names, uh, call me, with the modern language rather than with old or middle Irish. So for example, the title Imrava in Primordial's album is a proper noun in Irish. Likewise, Corhunacht is a medieval Irish term for a particular type of sorcery that involves hopping on one leg with one arm tied behind your back and one eye closed um, like a crane. Uh, I'm unaware of any Irish band that's doing anything similar to, say, Elevati's use of reconstructed Gaulish, Enslaved's use of Old Norse, or Oliver's, Oliver's use of an archaeo, archaic Dano-Norwegian in their debut album, Berktat. This is presumably because Old Irish is a fiendishly difficult language that nobody in their right mind would want to learn. Uh, none of the Irish musicians I've looked at are, to the best of my knowledge, native speakers of the language, and do not seem to be regular users you, regular users of the language, with the exception of Corwuna. Dublin's a very small place. Wrap up just a little bit yeah, because we're running out of time. Yeah, sorry, I'm almost done. Yeah, 
So I find this particularly interesting because the use of languages other than English is obviously a marked choice in metal. Um, writing and performing in one's national language is a very common strategy for folk and pagan metal as a way of asserting a national or regional identity. But in most cases, the national language is also the first language of the musicians. The decision to sing in a national language, which is not one's first language, and perhaps not even a language that one speaks fluently, is an interesting one. And it seems to be much more of a statement regarding uh, national identity than singing in one's first language might be. It's a much more deliberate and purposeful uh, act. The, major the majority of these bands output, however, is in English. The use of some Irish gives the appearance of authenticity to an international market. And while, while lyrics in English are more accessible to audiences and ultimately easier for most Irish musicians to write, and again, Corvuna is a very important exception to this trend. So uh, quick conclusion, time is running out. Uh, as I noted earlier, Came, uncovered far more material than I anticipated. Um, so my approach has been more broad and more shallow than I really would have liked it to be. Still, this wealth of material shows that Ireland has a cultural patrimony, which has had a disproportionate impact on many aspects of global culture, including metal. And Irish musicians have taken a number of different stances in relationship to this material. And the various political formations articulated in Irish pagan and folk metal are fruitful venues for further research. Research, I guess, will. Thank you very much. We have a little bit of time for questions, if we can do so. Uh, the first one being from Thomas again. Um, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about the reception of Irish or Celtic um, mythology and legends in Brazilian, um, and particularly from Tuahade Danon, uh, the band there, if you've had a chance to look into that in your very wide ranging research. Yes. So the only band that I came across was Tuahade Danon, and I, or Tuahade Danon, uh, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to look at them in, in, in great depth, so I can't really, I'm hesitant to say anything there lest I, you know, generalize too much from the tiny bit of evidence I have. Um, but it seems fairly infrequent. Really, it's just the one band from Brazil that seems like really, really interested in that. And they, as I mentioned in the comments earlier, they have also collaborated with uh, Martin Walkier of Skyclad, who is uh, a fairly, uh, obviously fairly influential um, folk metal, pagan metal artist in coming from England who claims to be interested in the, the Celtic tradition. And there's references to sorts of uh, indigenous English uh, manifestations of Celticity, but not so much Irish ones there. So I think, um, yeah, if I had sort of cast my net broader and looked more at um, the Celtic in general and how that's received, because I think a lot of people are not really seeing I think for a lot of people, the kind of dis subtle distinctions between, say, Irish and Breton or Irish and Iceni are, are lost. So if I had cast my net a little bit broader there, I think I might have, um, yeah, I think I might have uh, had more interesting things to say there. Sorry, no, that's not really an answer. That's all right, no worries. If we can squeeze one more question into the last two minutes of our panel, uh, one from Amanda is um, if you have found any references to Dolores Price and Morrigan together in your uh, survey of lyrics and I, uh, themes. I actually haven't. Um, again, a, a lot of the bands which would invoke the Morgan once or twice, I, I didn't pay all that much attention to them in the process of doing this because, uh, as you can see, there was a lot and I had a limited amount of time in which to put this presentation together. Um, but I don't think I saw anything like that, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for an excellent panel. Um, fantastic discussion. I am, the chat is blowing up. It is difficult for me mm -hmm. to keep up almost as a chair.